Right, well, uh, welcome back to uh, Countdown into Australia, Meatloaf. Thank you, Ian. Uh, up, where, is, where are we now? Dallas? No, no we're uh, in Austin, Austin, Texas, the capital of Texas. Right. And if you... Nope, you can't look out that way and see the Capitol building. We're lower. Well, I'm waiting for the for the tur what is it? The, the turtles. The turtles. Yeah, there's this is turtle land here all right. along by. This is the Colorado River. Right yeah. here we have the Colorado River, and this river runs from the Gulf of Mexico down by uh, Galveston all the way through the Grand Canyon in Arizona. I tell you what, we've gone far enough. I think we'll <laughs> stick right here. Now listen, uh, a lot's happened to you since um, since you're out in Australia. Uh, the yeah. album went so well in Australia. Still just still selling. Yeah. Still selling. They yeah. called us the other day. Said it was up to I don't know some enormous figure. Right. Don't you know, enormous figure for records. Yeah, it did. Uh, you know, all over the world. All uh, album did real well all over the world, with the exception of Japan. Right. I don't know. <laughs> it's been a long time since that album was released, though. Yeah, two years. But that's all right. Gives you time to uh, sort of sit back and uh, and gather things in and figure out where you're going from here, because uh, you have to have a plan. You know, if you go too fast and it. You lose your sight of your game plan, you know, it's like playing a soccer game or a rugby game, you know, or something like that, without a game plan. If you play too many in a row, you don't know who you're playing or who you're playing against or what you're playing for. Right. And so, you know, I had, to, you know, some emotional problems coming off of, uh, you know, uh, the fact that you are successful is just sort of tough. The fact that you are a star right. gets a little tough, you know, it gets a little mentally tough, the fact, because I never wanted to be called a star, you know, or anything like that. But then... You, the fact is that you are, and you have to deal with it, and you have to come to grips with the, that fact. And so that takes a while for a person to deal with that. And uh, you just sort of learn how to deal with your lifestyle. It's a different life, you know? Now, with that out of hell, uh, not that it was a concept album, but it was an album that uh, was unique uh, in its time of being released because there was nothing else around, and probably nothing since like that sort of album. People have tried, but nothing like that, you know? Um, uh, even our uh, second one is not... It, not like that. It's it's a different kind of thing. I think it's as good, if not better, in some respects. But it's different, you know. Right. And uh, it was hard coming up with the. <laughs> it was real tough uh, trying to have a follow to Bad Out of Hell, because Bad Out of Hell is a real special record. I mean, I still listen to that today, and I've known it longer than anybody else. Uh, and I love that record. And I'm gonna. I love the new one too, you know. What's and it uh, got the new one's bad for good. Bad for yeah. Good. It was, the working title was Renegade Angel, but the song never got written, so we didn't do that one. Uh, it's bad for good. That's the same songwriters, the same. Team Jim Steinman, yeah, me and Jimmy, and uh, Todd started out on the project, and uh, we sort of lost him somewhere in the shuffle. I'm not quite sure where, but, but that's all right, you know, because he did a lot of good work on this new record, and then Jimmy sort of took over, and then I sort of took over, and then the movie sort of took over right. that I'm doing now. Well, I was now. about to say, like, it's not that you've been idle in the last two years and you're in the middle of, uh, of doing a movie. Yeah, no. Alice since, Cooper, have already, has already right, Alice about, Cooper, Blondie, Blondie yeah. Roy, Roy Orbison. So can the man himself tell us about the movie? Sure. Um, the movie's about a character by the name, it's called Rhodey, right. just Rhodey, not the Rhodey, but Rhodey. And it's a, a man called, uh, it's about a, the story of a man called Travis W. Redfish, who was uh, from Corpusville, Texas. And Travis uh, Redfish, is a drives a beer truck and delivers beer and is mechanical genius and the, the the idea of the movie is to create the new hero the new american hero or the new world hero or whatever meaning me which is sort of humorous to me and uh, and he gets he knows nothing about music business at all and he doesn't understand why anybody makes records and why anybody did since buddy holly died anyway you know that's right. his trip and he's into country and western or you know country rock or whatever um and he gets picked up by a girl named lola blue Bula Bays from tulsa oklahoma who is a groupie and who is a virgin right and how many virgin groupies there are, i don't really know but anyway so she takes him on this adventure, and this is, a, and he becomes a roadie. Right. And he doesn't know what a roadie is when it first starts, and he he sets up um, Hank Williams' equipment uh, in ten minutes, right. you know, sound and everything. And it's like it has, you know, you pan the club where he's at, and he comes back around, and it's all set up. Right. And uh, he fixes transmissions and drives without clutches and fixes televisions and and builds an entire. Um, they cut the power on a Blondie concert, and he he uses trucks and hay wagons and horse manure and cow manure and all this stuff and puts it all together and creates this entire unit to run an entire concert. And then uh, at the end of the movie, they, I, well, I won't tell you the end. Oh, Nobody, right. you're not supposed to tell the end. I don't know. That's something I've seen on well, television. Don't ever like, tell them in. Outside your hotel with all the, all the cruise equipment and that, there's a beer truck. 
Oh yeah, beer there's a bus. There's with, a bus, um, Texas, Texas or bus. bus. Yeah, well that's uh, Alice Cooper. See, I save Alice Cooper's concert. Right. He's got this brand new world famous sound equipment and, and nobody can fix it. You know, nobody knows what's wrong with it. And Travis comes in and asks for a dime and a knife and you know, some tin foil and stuff and fixes it. And it's the it's it's called the Redfish Way. Right. Because this guy, you know, and uh, he and so he wants to go home because his sister's getting married to his best friend and Alice says, Well if you fix my sound system I'll get you a bus. Right. So that's it. I come from New York, Madison Square Garden down to Texas in this bus. And to Joe Ely's Texas, you and me. Now, can you just tell us some of the people that are in it? There's Oh, Art Carney and uh, Gaylord Sartain, who's on a show called Hee Haw here in America, and this young actress who's in a Paul Mazursky film, which is coming out in December, called Khaki Hunter, who's fantastic. Uh, Rhonda Bates, who is on a lot of American television. And then uh, there's uh, Blondie, Alice Cooper, uh, Roy Orbison, Hank Williams Jr. Uh, the soundtrack consists of C Bob Seger, The Cars, Jackson Brown, Styx, Earth, Wind & Fire, myself. Uh, I, it goes on and on and on. And for a singer, you're not really singing? No, I don't sing in this film. The only time that I actually, I, it's not really singing, it's a thing where I make a group because they refuse to go on. Uh, I bend this mic stand, scare them half to death, right. and force them out there, and I see this girl Lola, and we do this thing that's sort of like, um, uh, it's sort of like a based on, a, on the Queen thing, uh, um, oh, uh, get down, make love. Right. It's a sort of rhythm thing, and it goes, I go Lola, and they go Lola, Lola, Lola. You know, it's sort of spoken, kind of sung kind of thing. But on the record, we're writing a whole piece, which will be on the soundtrack, uh, make it a whole song, because they, they want to release that as a single. Now, before we get on to your touring plans, uh, did any of your roadies take you out and teach you how to be a roadie? No, see, I was a roadie first. You know, I've been in the business for 13, 6, 50, I don't know how long, a long time. And I started out, you know, as a lead singer, and you run the sound, you know, from where you stood, and you run the lights by pushing on the things on the floor. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and so I wouldn't let anybody touch the equipment with this band because they only slowed me down and I had my I what I had was different sets of gloves for different things and I had these mitts for these roadie and I packed the trucks and trailers set up and, and could fix amps and so I knew what to do you know I know what I go and uh, be a lot of times that we were late the crew was late or something on our tours you know and I'd be in there it's in there and they'd they'd be telling me the union crew would be going what, who are you and what are you doing in here I go well um uh, I just came down to see what's going on but you're not supposed to be here I said well I, I am and they uh -huh. You know, but I'd go down with the crew and hang out and check it out. So I know basically what's going on as a roadie. Right now, you've got uh, w w the album you hope that your album uh, is out hopefully when? Well, as soon as I finish this picture, which we don't know, I mean, it's about three or four days behind, so it'll probably be a week late, sometime the end of December. Right. Then I hit the studio once again, and I got to finish up a few vocals, and then we got to mix it. You know, I can't see any more than six weeks, right. seven weeks after we get out. Maybe at the, in February, then and if not a, the first of March, then a tour, right? Then I have a tour in which, I, uh, with the third record, is going to be a live record. It's right. around the world, and uh, we're going to start in Australia with right. it. And uh, you told me to say this, so I will. Right. <laughs> well, I want to play in Tasmania, because they got this thing about I want to make it a Tasmanian release, <laughs> limited Tasmanian release, you know, for my around the world thing. And so I'm going to record. Like in, in, you know, if I can get to Tasmania, I don't know, but I would like to, I like the name Tasmania. I want to record in Sydney and Melbourne, right. you know, and then sweep on in and go into, this you know, for the, for, the live for the live album, do one, you know, and we'll record like 25 cities right. and, and take something from each performance, you know, right. so that, it, you know, it's like everybody feels a part of the record. Now, I've got to ask you, how grueling is it for you? You've put so much, I mean, when we saw you last time on stage and we first got the, the taste of it with the Well, listen, I never wanted to work again, if that's what you're asking right. me. When I finished after 11 months, I'm on the floor right. and I'm going, I ain't going back out. I mean, I never want to work again. I've had it. What the hell are you doing, you know? And I locked myself up and then we start for about three months and then we started on the record last January. And then I started to sing again, and I didn't feel right. I didn't want to do it. I wasn't into it. You know, I wanted to rest. And then when I finally did get around to it, I started to sing. And we started to sing really hard. And then I did all these vocals, and then I wanted to go back in and do them, and something happened. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. It was, like, really bizarre. I thought, I thought it was mental. Right. So I went to a hypnotist and all these things. Finally, I went to this doctor, and he says, no, I had a paralyzed vocal cord. It was, like, sort of swell you get hoarse and after you get hoarse and it swells down swelling goes down it's not like a nodule or something you know where you have to operate mm -hmm. but anyway it's sort of permanently sort of swollen for a while and it wouldn't vibrate properly on this side so he said rest and so in that period of time i had you know the, the late 60s you know because 
uh, Joplin and Hendrix and all those people came out of there to me. It wasn't rock and roll. We were talking about 30s relationships, you know, which is cool to sing about if you're Andy Williams. That's, or what, I'm not putting down Andy Williams. Or if you want to do that, that's fine. But don't call, don't put the tag on it, rock and roll. Because rock and roll, you know, it's uh, that, that whole energy, that fever, and you know, it's got to... Uh, Meat Life Part 2, and I promise you won't talk as much this time, Mark. It's not true. <laughs> right, well, yeah. and it, it was real boring, and, it, and I just, I got tired of it. I got out, you know, I got completely out of the music and went to, into, into theater in New York. Well, theater and, had seemed to have a lot. I mean, like you had sort of Jesus Christ, if yeah, God spelled Yeah, but I don't yeah. consider that rock and roll either, you know. I, that's, they, that's, that wasn't really rock and roll. I mean, that was sort of... Uh, uh, rock beat, <laughs> you know, I had, you know, the four or four drums, you know, going on it, but it wasn't really rock and roll. And then all of a sudden, uh, people like Seeger, Bob Seeger and Bruce Springsteen, and people like that just sort of kept pushing at it. And The Who kept pushing at it, and The Stones kept pushing at it. And they started, this resurgence started, and that sort of, you know, it sparked some people, you know, it sort of sparked myself. And, and I said, well, Ah, there you go. Let's go get it. Let's go do some rock and roll, you know. And then uh, Tom Petty, and then, uh, and then all of a sudden, we got it, it, it to the, you know, which sort of left the entire sort of industry, and like going, wait a minute, what's going on here? You know, there's some talented people who did Donna Summer for one, who is is a real good singer, real talented, and she's not gonna do disco on the next record. She's gonna start singing, you know, and that's what Donna Summer's gonna do, and I think that that's great, you know. And there was some there was some legitimate acts, you know, but most of it there was no real artist, and they didn't sell. They didn't sell through, uh, and now that period's sort of going over, and I. And I really like that, you know. And there's a uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of people now. Tom Petty and the, you know a whole lot of people. Uh, you were naming some other people, you know, out of Australia and things like that. And it's we're coming back around. And I I I think that uh, you know right. you know what I mean. Go ahead and well, well, guns blazing. Cause James Conn's not gonna go into a bar. Or Warren Beatty's not gonna go in a bar and smash over his head with somebody with a beer bottle. Give me a break, you know. And these people that you know out here gonna do some numbers, you know, and that's sort of what it's like, and it feels real good. Well, police was saying last night in an interview in, in Houston that the energy crisis is gonna is gonna have a lot to do with rock and roll. Like rock and roll will make statements that that they'll have I, to refine themselves for the. Energy I think crisis. yeah, I, I think rock and roll will make statements, but I think I think rock and roll. I think politically, rock and roll, you know, it's like it always sort of makes statements, but. Joplin and those people sort of made statements in a whole nother way, you know? Mm -hmm. I think rock and roll has to take a stand instead of make a statement. Right. You know what I'm saying? I think the rock and roll performers, separate and apart from their music, can make the political statements and, and control the political, you know, the political side of it. But I think the music itself has to take the stand instead of take the situation. Right. You know? So it's like, it's going to have a lot to do with a lot of different things, you know? But I think rock and roll is always rock and roll. I mean, so you're, you're not going to, you're not going to take the Stones. The Stones aren't going to start t singing about President Carter. Right. You know what I mean? And I don't think that's where rock and roll should go, and I never did, right. you know? Uh, you look optimistically at the 80s. Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, I think, I think, I think we're coming at it. Right. And I think all, you know, the kids that are, you know, I mean, it's like I'm hoping that, that, that I'm helping someone. You know, I'm, I'm hoping that I'm opening doors and I'm like clearing a path for somebody to run right over my back. All right, well, listen, we wish you luck and you've got so much on your plate and we can't wait for you to come out to Australia. Oh, uh, listen, I'll see you guys soon. All right. And tell that mother not to ask me anymore when I'm going to lose weight and give you a show because I gave you a hell of a show last time. <laughs> <laughs> Cut! <laughs>